Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on what I've entitled the Christian First Aid Kit, and we're teaching our fifth teaching in a six-part set in that album. And we're teaching from John 14, 28, where Jesus told his disciples that he, they had heard that he was going to go away and come again. And because he had said this, uh, sorrow had filled their heart. But he says, if you loved me, you would rejoice because I say I'm going to the Father because my Father is greater than I. And from this, I've been teaching all of this week that actually it's our own self-centeredness that causes grief in our life. Jesus is saying if the disciples would have been more focused on him and thinking more about him, they could have actually rejoiced after seeing him crucified because at least he would go to the Father, the one that he loves so much. His hurts, his pains would be over, and they could have rejoiced. Instead, they were full of sorrow and fear because they were thinking about themselves. What has this done to my plans? I gave up everything, and for what? They're going to come after me. And really, self-centeredness is the source of all of our grief. You know, the man, Ed Lee, who runs our television camera, told me that the very first time he ever heard me on television, we used to use teases before I started into the teaching, and I came on and said something about many of you are, uh, uh, have low self-esteem and timid and shy, and that's nothing but self-centeredness. Stay tuned for the gospel truth. <laughs> he said it made him so mad, uh, but it got his attention. And I tell you, that's exactly what these verses are saying. Let me go back to a verse that I used on our program yesterday, Proverbs 13:10. It says, only by pride cometh contention. Only. That's the only way. There is no other way. And yet, yesterday I tried to get this point across that some people think, oh, no, it's, it's my personality type. No. None of you were born with just anger and bitterness in your heart. That is a developed trait, that, and the root of it right here is pride. Some people say, well, it's what this person did to me that made me angry. No, it's not what people do to you that make you angry. This says that it's pride that causes this contention. Some people say, well, I was abused and I had this happen and that happen. No. It's your pride. It's your self-centeredness. It's the fact that you focused on your hurts and pains. And that's what makes you angry. I know that there's people that don't like this, but I'm telling you, this is what the Word of God says. And I tried to explain this yesterday that I had a man come up and say, I've got low self-esteem. Pride isn't my problem, and yet I'm very angry. The root of all pride is just selfishness, self-centeredness. And you can be arrogant over here, exalting yourself above everybody else and saying that's pride, but you can also be over here thinking, oh, I'm, I'm no good, I'm unworthy. That is self-centered, which I believe is the root of all pride. And that's self-centeredness. It's pride. You are very self-centered if you were sitting here thinking about how ungodly and unworthy you are. And again, I can use my own personal testimony to make that point. Look over here in Numbers chapter um, 12. And this is where Miriam and Aaron came out against Moses and criticized him. And it says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Ethiopians were black. Moses was, of course, Middle Eastern or, or Israeli, so kind of uh, fair-skinned. And so this was an interracial marriage. And M Miriam and Aaron came out against Moses because he had married a black woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And in verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Boy, that is one astounding statement right there. We don't know how many people were on the earth at this time, but we know that there was over three and a half million Jews that came out of the land of Egypt. 
And so there was three and a half million Jews. They were a minority in Egypt, and so there was more than three and a half million Egyptians, and that was only a one country. And so, you know, I don't know how many people were on the face of the earth, but I'm sure there was 10 million or 20 million or who knows, millions and millions of people. And Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. What a statement. And here's the reason I was reading this verse is because guess who wrote that? Moses is the one that wrote this. Moses is the one who wrote, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. The reason I'm bringing this out is because, see, some people think that the only pride, the only way they see it is that it's arrogance, thinking you're better than everybody else. But did you know that, let's, let's just say right now, that we were in a meeting together. There was 100 or 200 people in a room. And if you were one of those sitting in the room, there would have to be one person in that group that was more humble, more meek than any other person. And if I was to say, let's everybody bow our heads and let's pray and let's ask God to reveal to us and to speak who is the meekest person in this room. And if you're the one, if God speaks to you that you're the one, then you stand up and you let us know that you're the meekest person in this room. <laughs> Did you know that most people would say, well, I'd never do that. Even if God spoke to me, I wouldn't say it. Why? Because, well, what would everybody think about me? So we kind of adopted this thing that pride is only arrogance, thinking you're better than everybody else. But religion has said, knock yourself down. Think bad of yourself. Put yourself down, and you can't knock yourself down far enough. That's okay. But if you go just one inch above what is the right evaluation of you, that's pride. But you can go as far in the other direction as you want to go, criticizing yourself and thinking bad of yourself. But you know what true humility is, is a person who isn't exalting themselves above what God says, nor debasing themselves. It's just a person who doesn't have an opinion. They love God more than themselves. And if the Lord was to speak to you and say, you are the most humble, stand up and tell every person. A truly humble person would do it because you wouldn't care what people think. You wouldn't exalt yourself and say, I'm better than everybody else, but at the same time, you wouldn't debase yourself. If God told you that you were the meekest person, true humility would be to say about yourself what God says. That's what Moses did. Moses said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I am the meekest man on the face of the earth. That's awesome. And yet, see, we've got this skewed impression of what true humility is. I'm sure that every person has heard somebody in church. I heard this a lot when I was a kid, and people would stand up and say, well, I don't have a very good voice, uh, but you all just pray for me. The Lord says, make a joyful noise. And so then they start singing, and they got this operatic voice. They've been through music school. They were trained, and they have a great voice, but they put themselves down because, see, we've been taught that that's humility is to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just nothing. And they don't mean it. It's a religious con. It's a religious um, thing that we've adopted because you could go up to them in the grocery store during the week and say, you know what, you were right. I really do believe that you have one of the worst voices that I've ever said. If you were to say about them what they said about themselves, they would get mad. You know why? Because they are self-centered. Only by pride comes contention. And the truth was they didn't really believe they had a bad voice. That was a way of putting themselves down, hoping that you'll come up and say, oh, don't ever say that about yourself. You're really wonderful. I enjoyed your singing. It's a backhanded way of fishing for a compliment. It was self-centered. You know what a truly humble person is? Is a person who doesn't really care about what people think one way or the other. They aren't promoting themselves, but they also aren't putting themselves down. Religion is basically said that low self-esteem is good. Well, let me rephrase that. It is good for you to recognize that by yourself you are nothing. But religion has said that just put yourself down and, and you can't think badly enough about yourself. But if you accept any honor at all, then you aren't humble. 
I heard a story about a man that, you know, they took a vote in a church and they, they voted to see who was the most humble person. And so on Sunday morning, everybody agreed it was dear old brother so-and-so. So on Sunday morning, they had him come up and they presented him with a humble button, a big old red button that said humble across it. And because he accepted it, they took it away. <laughs> That's the way that most people see are. They think that if you're truly humble, you would, oh, no, I don't deserve this. But you know what? True humility is not exalting yourself, promoting yourself, but it's also not debasing yourself. You know, a friend of mine, he went to, uh, I think it was Nigeria, but one of the African nations, and he held a meeting and saw people healed and the miracles happen. I think blind eyes open and, I mean, notable miracles happen. So the next day he was in the marketplace of this town and he was walking through and people began to recognize him from the crusade from the night before and they began to start yelling and coming and wanting to touch him. And they were saying things, you know, in a language he didn't understand, but it was obvious they wanted the power of God and they were wanting to touch him. And his first reaction was to go, no, it's not me, it's not me, don't touch me, it's all about Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people that if you say, Boy, that, that teaching really blessed me. It ministered to me. They go, no, it's not me. It's not me. It's Jesus. And they try and, and just constantly put themselves in a position, of, oh, I'm nothing. It's all Jesus. Well, see, he had this first reaction was to do that. But right before he could say anything, the Lord spoke to him and he said, what would you have thought if that little donkey that I rode into Jerusalem and when the people saw me, they began to start running and throwing their garments on the on the ground and they begin to say, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And they begin to praise God. What would you have thought if that donkey would have said, no, it's not me. It's not me. Don't worship me. <laughs> Nobody thought it was the donkey. They weren't praising the donkey. They were praising the one that was riding on the donkey. And the Lord spoke to my friend and he says, they aren't after you. They're after me in you. They see me in you and says, let them touch you. And so he just started walking through like this and letting people touch him, and people started being healed. Now, see, most people would think, well, that's arrogance. No, that's humility. That's humility, recognizing that me by myself am nothing, but I am never by myself. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. And so I just, I don't exalt myself. Yes, that would be pride, but you're debasing yourself is also pride. When the Lord says, you can do all things, and you say, oh, but I, I can't do anything, then you are exalting your opinion and your feelings and your emotions above what the Word of God says. So anyway, I just bring that out to say that when people sit here and see this passage of Scripture that says only by pride comes contention, they think, well, that can't be true because I've got anger, I've got contention in my heart, and yet I'm not an arrogant person. But are you a self-centered person? Are you a person who only thinks about your side? Maybe you aren't self-centered in the sense that you think you're better than everybody else, but you are worse than everybody else, and you just constantly are you're, you're nurturing, nursing a hurt and a pain in your life from 20 and 30 years back, and you've been focused on yourself and what people did and how you were hurt, and because of that, you carry a chip on your shoulder. You know, I've had employees here. I had one woman I can think of that, I mean, hated men because of her past experiences, and it affected everything else. We eventually had to fire the woman and let her go because she just had a chip on her shoulder from past things, and she could sit here and say, well, it's the way people treated me. No, it's the fact that she focused on it, and she never got over it, and she never was able to cast that over on the Lord. She never accepted how much God loved her and let that heal her, and instead she just carried this and limped through life with it. And you know what that is? That's self-centered. It's pride, and that's what caused contention. That's what these verses are saying. I know that many of you watching this program are saying, no, 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 I refuse to accept that it's me that has caused this anger. It's what this person did. This person may have done something that presented you with a temptation or an opportunity to get angry, but you're the one that has to choose for that anger to dominate. You can choose to just let it go. You can choose to forgive that person. 
And if you would look on their side, see, again, only by pride, which is at its root, selfishness, self-centeredness, only when you're looking at things from your standpoint does this strife and this anger rise up. But when you look at things from other people's standpoint, that's how you diffuse this anger. You know, when I pastored churches, I had lots of people come to me for marriage counseling, and I would sit down and I'd listen to this person rail against their mate and say what this mate had done and why they were upset and stuff. And one of the things that I constantly did was just not say, well, now, they did this. But why did they do this? And I, I can think of a couple of examples, especially with men. It seems like men just are not sensitive and in tune to their wives near as much as the wife is in tune to the men. Uh, anyway, that's another teaching. But I can think of a number of men who would sit there and talk about their wife and the way that she responded and what she did. And, and it wasn't that I approved of what the wife did, but then I'd go back and I'd say, now why did they do this? And we'd go back and start thinking about why they did it. I can think of one person in particular that um, the in-laws just ragged on this woman and they criticized her constantly and because of it she was very outspoken and she said things that offended the parents of the man and she said some things that were harsh that shouldn't have been said and so the man told me this but I said why is she saying that and he says, well, I don't know. Never thought about why she says it. And as we begin to discuss it and deal with it, you know why this woman said this? Because the husband would not defend his wife. The husband was cleaving to his parents more than he was cleaving to his wife. And the husband disagreed with the parents in the way that they treated the wife. And he, by his own admission, said that they do treat her wrong and they don't treat her the way that they treat me and they never wanted me to marry her and they don't like her. And so he admitted that this wasn't just the woman's perception. The parents-in-law were t treating the woman wrong, and the man would not defend her. And the Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 3 that we are supposed to be the defender of our wife. We're the head. We're supposed to protect her. And this man had not left his parents and was cleaving unto his wife. He was actually cleaving unto his parents and not wanting their disapproval, and he was letting them say harsh, mean things to his wife. And so the wife said some things that she shouldn't, but you know why she did it? Because her husband wouldn't defend her, and she felt like she had to defend herself. She didn't do it correctly, but nonetheless, it was actually his fault that the wife had to be so aggressive. And when I shared that, did you know that his rejection and his criticism of his wife over what she said all of a sudden changed when he realized, whoops, the reason she's like this is because I'm not the person I'm supposed to be. And we made a decision and we prayed. And his parents were godly people. They were friends of mine. They were actually supporters of mine. They had actually given us one of the largest gifts that this ministry had ever received at this time. And you know what? I wasn't against them, but they were wrong in just dumping on her and trying to separate this marriage. And I told that man, you need to forsake your father and mother and cleave to your wife. Not forsake them in the sense that you hate them, but you just need to make a distinction that, you know what, this is my wife and I'm honoring her. We prayed. They did that. There was a strained relationship for a period of time. These people who were friends of mine and partners of mine got mad at me because of my counsel. But you know what happened? That marriage straightened up. And that couple who was on the verge of divorce is still married to this day. And, you know, one of the, that, that was just one instance. I'm not saying that that's the total thing. But it was when he quit just looking at what she did and thinking, why is she doing it? And ultimately came to realize that she was having to be assertive and aggressive and defend herself because he wouldn't do it. And when he saw that, all of a sudden, every bit of his anger and displeasure at his wife was gone when he saw why she was doing what she was doing. When he quit thinking about just selfishly and thinking about, look what this is doing to me and my relationship with my parents, and when he began to see her side of the story. You know, I believe that basically every marriage 
problem could be solved if the marriage partner would look at the other person and not just evaluate what they're doing, but why do they do this? You know, I actually had a woman who worked for me whose husband was a demon-possessed man. He did terrible things. He beat her, poured hot grease over her, tried to cut her with a butcher knife, broke her neck one time. I could go on and on. It's a long story, but it was a bad, bad situation. Everybody else told her to divorce. I told her that she needs to love him, and I taught her these exact same things. She was angry at him because of things he had done. And most people would say, well, you're justified. But again, only by pride comes contention. Now, I'm not saying that every marriage you should just stay even if they're threatening to kill you, but I'm saying that this woman wanted to stay. I taught her how to see the other side of the situation, and she actually got to realizing that this man, he was a Jamaican, he was dedicated to the devil at his birth. They actually killed chickens and blood was spilt and a covenant was made and he was dedicated to the devil and he was demon possessed from the time he was a little kid. And as she began to see the other side, why is this man so mean? Why is he the way that she, he is? She actually got to where she loved him and she was able to look past the things that he was doing to her because she was no longer just self-centered and thinking only about what he was doing to her. She saw his side and she was able to love him. He got born again and their marriage was put back together. And this man, they began to start having problems because he wanted to go to Ramah and become a pastor and she didn't want to be a pastor's wife. He turned from being a demon-possessed, totally anti-God person who was mean and vicious and violent to a person who was born again and wanting to go into the ministry because somebody looked beyond his actions and thought about why did he do this. You know, I know that there's people watching this program right now that the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. And if you would respond to this by taking the person that you've had anger towards, and I'm not saying that the person has not done you wrong. It's not a matter of who's right and wrong. But if you would look beyond the right and wrong and who's right and wrong in this and just say, Father, why are they doing this? Help me to see their side of what's going on. Some of you would come to realize that this person is the way they are because of the way you've been. Or maybe they are the way they are because of past hurts and things that have happened to them and on and on and on. And you could get, you could get past this anger, this contention in your life, if you would quit only thinking about what they've said or what they've done to you, and if you would look at the other person's side of the story, it would make a total transformation in that relationship. I really believe that that's God speaking to many of you all around the world right now. And I just encourage you to let God flow through you in a selfless way and get to the place where Jesus said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge or excuse me, that was Stephen. Jesus said, Father, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. If you would get to thinking about the other person, the hate, the anger in your heart would be gone right now. Praise God, that's awesome. I encourage you to get these materials that we're offering. All right, listen to our announcer. He's going to give you some information and then call or write today. Today's complete teaching titled Christian First Aid Kit was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth Seminar. This series has over six hours of teaching and is available on either audio CD or DVD. Each is available for 19 pounds. This teaching is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 19 pounds when you contact us. Or you can get the Christian First Aid Kit as part of the Survival Kit package. In addition to Christian First Aid Kit, this package also includes the Christian Survival Kit, a 16-part series. Together, these two series provide 22 hours of teaching. The entire package has a catalog value of 55 pounds, but today you can get the Survival Kit package for just 50 pounds when you order. The fifth audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth CD titled Christian First Aid Kit Part 5 Free of Charge. 
On today's program, Andrew mentioned the booklet, Self-Centeredness, The Root of All Grief. This product is available for two pounds 50 when you contact us. I know that the Lord was speaking to many of you through this program today, and you received that word that I gave about how you just need to pray and see the other person's side of the story and quit only thinking about yourself. You know, if that was you that God was speaking to, I'd like to encourage you to call the number that you see on your screen right now and let someone pray with you and minister to you and help you to do this. We have some really powerful anointed people who have understood the truths that I'm talking about today and they will be able to help you. So that number is there. I encourage you to please call, get the materials, but also let someone pray with you about seeing the other person's side of the story. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44-1922-473-300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Warwickshire, England for the Grace and Faith Family Camp May 27th through the 30th and in Colorado Springs, Colorado for the Summer Family Bible Conference July 4th through the 8th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. do not have to motivate God to heal. God wants to heal more than you want to be healed. The almost too good to be true news you can use. www.awmi.net This Bible teacher started with the simple message of God's unconditional love and grace. For years, he and his wife duplicated teaching tapes in their own home. He went on radio and often gave his teachings away to those who asked for them. Years later, a small building was needed to house a few volunteers and employees. The ministry grew until it was bursting at the seams. Soon, the next 15,000 square foot building became too small as a Bible college and television ministry were launched. Today, a 110,000 square foot building is running out of room. 157 acres have been purchased to accommodate the growth, but the message remains the same. It's the gospel truth. For more information on this and other stories, visit awmi.net. Click on Ministry News and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries.